Everest here from Portals to the Past and the 10th Essex. Today we're going to be taking a really close look at 08 webbing and how you care for it and what's good and what's not so good and also how you need to set your webbing up for the, broadly speaking, the two periods, so early war and post up, uh, getting up towards the Battle of the Somme. So this is what your 08 webbing should look like. Okay, this is a set of 08 webbing. Well, this is probably one of the best sets of webbing designed during the last 120 years, 130 years. It's a fantastic piece of equipment. I know people will probably argue with me about this all day long, but this really is lightning in a bottle. And the British Army took a long time to come to this final, uh, this final kind of pattern, this, this look and then these adjustments. It is an amazing set of equipment. It's made from pre-stretched canvas, cotton canvas, which we've got a lot of connections with, obviously from the Americas and from Egypt and all these places across the empire. So this is why we're using canvas. It's better than leather because leather rots in the field. Now, leather obviously is used during the First World War even by the British because we run out of cotton canvas really quickly. So this stuff really is fantastic. And one of the things that makes it different from any other set is the cross straps on the back do not cross on the front. Now, early sets of webbing, you'll see them crossing on the front, see like the old white sets. These sets are basically, the British Army thought that it gave the soldiers something referred to as soldier's heart. What it was actually causing them was too much weight and too much pressure on their chest so they couldn't breathe properly. So they start to cut it and change it so the straps come directly over you, and this makes it much better, much more effective. It is an accident of design, but it is a fantastic and marvellous accident. This set that we've got here is rigged up to be 1916. Now we're going to take a really close look at how all this stuff works together and how the smaller changes are between 1914 and 1916. We're also going to look at how you blanco your webbing, which is going to be really the focus of, tonight, of today's video. So, let's have a look. Right, okay, so where to get good webbing from. If you have just started your First World War reenactment journey, or even if you're an old salt, you'll probably know some of these names that we're gonna say. There's a couple of really good supplies, and there's a couple of ones you really need to avoid. So, one of the ones that you'll often see crop up is Soldier of Fortune. They do some really, really good stuff with the webbing, but only if you buy their more expensive equipment. Now, you'll see there'll be the cheaper stuff, and there'll be the more expensive stuff. Don't fall into the trap of buying the cheaper stuff. The edges of the belts curl very quickly and they won't stand up to any kind of pressure at all. Really, if you're buying that cheap stuff, it's only to hang on a mannequin. Say if you're a museum uh, curator and you are on a very limited budget and you've got it on a mannequin that's going to be doing nothing at all. If you're doing any kind of marching or reenactment, what you need to do is get the more expensive stuff. The other place to go is Lawrence Ordnance. So the Australian viewers, you'll see most of you guys will have Lawrence Ordnance stuff already. Lawrence Ordnance produced really, really fantastic equipment. Shipping fees across to places like America and Britain kind of make it a bit tricky to get hold of, but it really is top quality gear. What Price Glory do a decent set of webbing as well. It's good, it's serviceable, and you're looking at about, it's about 200 to $250 US for it. It's pretty good, and if you go to Newville, majority of the guys will be using uh, what price glory stuff. Now, places to avoid, paddleators, anywhere that's really cheap. If you're looking at webbing that's less than 100 pounds, caveat emptor is the, in, in the Latin words, so buyer beware. You need to be really careful. If it's cheap um, webbing, it's probably because it's gonna be rubbish. So just be really, really careful with that. If you can get your hands on original stuff, Fantastic. The original kit is amazing quality. And you'll notice that particularly with the cross straps, the original stuff will hang the pouches and belts off them really, really well. However, like myself, a lot of reenactors may not fit into original equipment because we are significantly well fed compared to uh, what they were a hundred years ago. So you know, you know where I'm getting with that. Now, uh, important things to note about uh, comparing originals and modern reproduction most modern reproduction ones with the pouches, these pouches are supposed to fit three sets of charger clips of five rounds, so 15 rounds of 303 ammunition in them, but most modern reproductions will only be able to carry 10 in them. It's just a flaw that happens in most modern webbing. They can't kind of properly stretch over, and if you do, you'll tend to find the poppers 
will tend to fly off right at the most inopportune moments, okay? So try not to stress your webbing too much under there. Original ones will fit um, three chargers in straight away, easy peasy, but you'll find a lot of the more modern uh, equipment. You, you, if you can do it, fantastic, brilliant, T tell us how. But if you can't, don't panic too much about it. It's about having weight in the webbing that's really, really important. One of the big tricks that you'll see a lot of sort of newer, fresher reenactors will tend to not do this, is they'll leave their webbing pouches open, uh, or they'll leave their webbing pouches completely empty, and that's really not a good look. Um, the majority of the time you see it on the pictures from the Great War, if they're empty, it's probably because they've just come back from a battle. So yeah, okay, that's, a, that's, that's fine as, a, as an interpretation piece, but if you're marching, get them packed out. Now, packing your webbing pouches out, there's a bunch of ways you can do this. I use, a number of different things. I'll have on me a charger clip of five rounds like that with dead heads on them. These are just blank, it's not even blank, they're just dead shell casings with some heads on them. There's no firing, uh, there's, yeah, there's no primer on there at all. So these things have been fired years ago, there's no powder, there's nothing uh, that can go wrong with those at all, okay? So those look fantastic if you're going to be showing those to the public. And if you want your webbing to be a full set of these, you need 150 of these things, and this is gonna to start to get really, really heavy. Now, the other way of doing it is using charger clips filled with just uh, shell casings. That works just as well to pack it out. But the other way of doing it, if you're going to a location with a sensitive client that doesn't want you to use either blank ammunition or even deadheads, or even anything, so for example, you've got a VIP or a royal visit where you'll be inspected by security forces, what I would advise is packing your webbing out with something like that. It's four bits of um, card, corrugated cardboard, wrapped together with some black electrical tape. Pop that in your webbing and it packs it out enough to kind of give the appeal, uh, to give the appearance that it's, a, that it's a full set of webbing. So that's how to pack your webbing. A couple of things that we have of uh, the differences between early war and late war webbing. So we've got our one here that we just saw earlier is set up for 1916. 1914 webbing will change the pattern uh, fairly, uh, you'll, you'll see on the back you'll have what's commonly referred to as the small pack which should be called the haversack. The haversack is on the back in 1916, in 1914 it goes down to your side here and you'll see on the back in 1914 this, which is commonly referred to as a large pack, it is actually called a valise, okay? A large pack is what they often call it in the Second World War, this is a valise, okay? The valise very rarely changes, it doesn't really change much between this and the 1937 pattern, uh, which for, is a thing for Second World War enactors. But this should be packed with your great coat and your other bits and bobs, your extra air, uh, pair of underpants and all that sort of stuff as well. So that's empty at the moment. And that goes on your back and the straps lock the whole thing in place. If you're doing 1914 and you really want to get it right, you'll notice this set of webbing has these small straps here. This is an immediate answer to something that happens from trench warfare. Now these come in in about 1915. This is the Mark II pattern. And what it originally looks like is this. I'm going to show you a photo of that. And these don't have those little tabs on them. And there's a big problem with this. You lean up against a trench wall with these things and they fly open. And you'll see the cartridges fall out. And a lot of people think, well, did it really happen that badly? Absolutely it does. Anybody who's ever done any kind of interpretation or tactical event inside a trench will know the first time you lean up against a trench wall, these will go fly open and you'll have your shell guard casings and your brass all over the shop. So if you're doing anything post 1915, you absolutely need to get these things here because pretty much every single soldier would have jacked his old one in the bin and they would have got these straight away. So if you're doing anything post 19, uh, 1915, 1916, you need to have these straps on for the second pattern. I've never seen a picture of these things post the Somme, uh, of the original pattern post the Somme, okay? So you've got to have that. That's a really important thing. So that's what your webbing should look like. Now, it should fit across your body, and it should basically go between these two buttons here and hang off your hooks here. Now, depending on who you're getting your tunics from, 
Sometimes that might be an issue, but try and get it fit as best as you can. Learn when your webbing is set, because having webbing that's fitted poorly will make you uncomfortable, and more importantly, it will look incorrect. These guys were spending days and weeks in the field. Obviously, they wouldn't be wearing their webbing all the time. There's loads of pictures of them outside of their webbing, but they're gonna to wanna to wear it, and they're gonna wear it really, really well. Okay, so this is a really, really important thing. Wear your kit. Try it around. Wear it around the house, okay? Just do it. If you've got a Sunday afternoon free, pop it on, see if you can get it set. And if you need to make adjustments, you need a friend to do that with you as well, okay? So that's quite a useful thing, is having a, a second person to adjust those things for you. So let's take a look at how webbing should be treated. Treating for your 08 webbing is going to be really, really important. It makes it waterproof and importantly, it makes it look right. Now, Australian viewers, you can turn off now because most Australians never put Blanco on their webbing. So, Blanco, we're gonna be looking at it now. This is the, th the stuff that makes your webbing green. With, bizarrely enough, with a name like Blanco, it actually comes from the old white pipe clay. So this is from way back when, when the army used to white pipe clay their webbing equipment, their leather equipment. Now, there's two types of Blanco that I recommend, okay? Now, the first is the what a lot of people use, and it's this stuff here, we'll get a, a photo of it as well. And this stuff is available, you can get it from eBay, you get it from Soldier Fortune, What Price Glory, all these sorts of things. Now this is a, basically a paint, okay? It's, a, uh, it's an oil-based paint that you literally open up, stick a paintbrush in, and you paint directly onto your webbing, okay? So you've got to, you're gonna literally paint it onto the webbing and it's gonna come out this color. So this is Sunburn, okay, is the color for this. Do not get pea green, that is for 37 pattern webbing, okay? If you're doing Second World War, you want pea green. First World War, you want sunburn. Or khaki 103, which is the quippy equivalent. We'll talk about that in a second, okay? Now the way you do it is you literally dunk, dunk your paintbrush in and paint, just like painting a model. Painting it on, you can blanco pretty much every part that's canvas. Some of the times you'll see from 100 years ago, the inside, is unblankoed and sometimes you see it has been blankoed. So it's dealer's choice really as to whether or not you want to do it. I tend to do it as out of a matter of course and I like the whole thing to have a uniform look. I even tend to blanco the inside of the pouches as well as that makes it look really smart and also it's just one of those things it's just probably adding to the uh, to the protective nature of it. Again you don't have to you're just going to have to blank other stuff on the outside You'll often see things like the 08 walking out belts are only blank out on one side for those original ones. So you'll see them done on both sides sometimes and just on one side or the other. Now, that's this stuff. If you're gonna blank out your entire set of webbing, so that would be your full vest and the valise pack and the haversack, you're looking at about four and a half bottles of this stuff, okay? So, thing is, go in with a mate, get nine bottles and chuck one, split one between you, okay? So you're gonna look, you're looking at about four and a half bottles to cover the entire thing. If you can do it less, fantastic. If you need more, you're probably putting a bit too much on. Now what I use for all of my Blanco is Quippy. Now Quippy is, we'll get another photo of that. Quippy is basically like polish and it's pretty much how the original Blanco used to come. There's like a, a bunch of different ways. One of them was a paste you mixed with water this is basically like a boot polish. And what we do is we literally use a toothbrush and you're gonna be rubbing it in to the, uh, to the thing you're gonna to need to Blanco. Now we're gonna show you how this works, okay? And I'm gonna Blanco this entire thing before your very eyes. So the way we're gonna start it is we get the belt out and we're only gonna Blanco one side of this, okay? Because we haven't got all night. So we're gonna start with this edge here. And what I'm gonna do is get any old toothbrush, make sure you're not using it anymore, otherwise you're giving yourself a nice incredible Hulk green teeth. And what you're gonna do is take the quippy, just like that, okay? So strike it on there, and then in small circles, really rub it in. And you can see already starting to go that lovely green color. Now, with a bit of movie magic, we're gonna get this done.
up to your eyes and snuts, using the kind of language that makes the sergeant blush. Oh, who wouldn't join the army? That's what we all inquire. Don't we picture the poor civilians sitting around the fire? Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. Oh, it's a lovely war. Oh, be a soldier, eh? Oh, it's a shame to take the pain. As soon as rebellion has gone, we feel just as heavy as lead. But we never get up to the sergeant brings the breakfast up to bed. Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. Oh, oh, what do we want? We eggs and ham. when we, we got plum and apple jam. Oh, for the right turn, how do we spend the money we earn? Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. Okay, and we're pretty much there. We're just going to finish the last bit off, which is this tab here. We're not going to do the inside. We're just going to do this little tab here. And again, just making sure that the whole thing comes together and, and is blankoed on the parts that we are going to see. Now, uh, trick with a brass, make sure when you're blankoing your equipment that you disassemble it. That is a very important thing, is to just disassemble your equipment completely before you blanco it. And that means you don't get any kind of erroneous bits that are unblankoed, which your sergeant or your QSM will spot on parade and bore you out for. We've all had it done. Now, what I tend to do is slide the belts and slide the sliders around as well, making sure I'm blankoing underneath them. Uh, if you're going to do this as well, make sure you probably put something on your um, on legs, otherwise you'll get blank on your legs or on your sofa like this as well. Okay, so that is our complete belt, done from start to finish, took us around about 10 minutes, okay, and that's pretty well blanco that is. And this one, once it's dry in about 2-3 hours, leave it overnight, it'll be really fantastic and you'll see the light pick off out of that. Now if you are using a if you're using Quippy, for a full set of 08 pattern, I tend to use an entire tin, will get me through the cross straps, the pouches, the haversack, the water bottle carrier, the helve, and it'll get me most of the way through the valise, at which point I'll probably use another little bit from another tin of Quippy as well. Again, if you've got a mate, go in, buy three tins together, and you'll have an extra when you buy extra stuff. Say for example, you want to buy maybe a set of wire cutters or your, a piece of your webbing fails and you get a new piece. It's always good to have extra Blanco or Quippy floating around for you to do that. With the, uh, with the uh, extra um, toothbrushes at the end of it, you don't need to put them in nitromores or, uh, or anything like that at the end of it, just leave them as they are. Uh, you may need to run them under the tap, but honestly, I've never once cleaned those and they always come out with a really good, uh, really good effect to it. So that is how to clean and how to treat your Blanco. So that's looking fantastic, that's pretty much parade ready. Make sure you give it a good old polish on the brass as well once the whole thing's dry, and you'll get a really, really nice effect. You'll notice that the Blanco here is done with the, uh, with the bottle, and this Blanco here was done about five years ago, and probably needs another ego over, so it should be looking a lot like that. That's Kaki 103, that number for the Blanco, if you're gonna buy that in Quippy. Uh, this stuff is sold almost exclusively through old shops like uh, old shoe shops, old leather working shops. There's some of it on eBay as well. It used to go for four quid a tin. It's now going for about 14 quid a tin. So you've got to keep your eyes open for this stuff if you're going to try and find it uh, for anything less than about 15 quid. Again, always worth buying it in bulk and talk to the supplier. Make sure they don't charge you for, uh, for, for multiple, um, uh, multiple shipping deals. So that is our R8 Blanco on our R8 webbing. So now the last thing we're going to look at is what your webbing should look like once it's completely rigged and we'll do that for 1916 now. So let's put it on. And there we have it. Our white webbing set and rigged for battle. So this one here, make sure it's under your epaulets as well. You'll see pictures of them with them over as well. But if you get it in the field, say for example your epaulet um, button pings off and we've all had it happen, hook it over the top as well, you'll be fine. But I always hook it underneath. I'm not wearing any gas equipment right now, but you should be wearing gas equipment. And that, if you're doing 1917 onwards with your small box respirator, should go on first. Your small box respirator goes on first and your webbing goes on over the top of that. It's really, really important. It's basic stuff. You should really know that. If you've got a pH hood as well, it should be slung either left or right. Again, pictures show both sides. So on the back of the webbing, 
I've got it like this, and you can see, just like that, you can see I've got the 1917 rain cape, and I've got my little mess tin there as well. Make sure nothing's rattling about. It will rattle, but see if you can pack things in there, like socks and stuff like that. Make sure you don't eat the socks. I've done that before. So these things here, making sure they don't rattle. Again, it's all about comfort. It's all about where it all sits on your body. And making sure the whole thing is effectively on you, hanging comfortably, and worn correctly. Now, there are loads of different ways of wearing webbing, okay? There appears to be no one strict way. If everybody in the regiment is wearing it one way, wear it that way. You might sometimes see the, uh, the rain cape hung underneath the haversack with extra sets of straps. That looks pretty clever. I can't do it. It's amazing levels of stuff going on there. You'll see often people with great coats hanging them over as well, like in that early stuff, so pre-1914. So this is all sort of nuanced stuff and you can sort of play around with that and try around with it. But this really is the sort of battle order you should be looking for, for the SOM and onwards. Right. Thank you very much guys, this has been a two marks production, we'll hope to see you next time where we'll be taking a look at some different things from the dark ages. Thank you kindly.